The last thing I would like to discuss is um, instead of using the sensitivity analysis, so sensitivity analysis is sometimes frustrating so, because in reality, we don't know how big these partial square is. We are just saying if uh, unobserved variable is this large, then the bias would have been this big. And, you know, so that's an important, um, uh, important thought exercise, but it doesn't solve the unobserved confounding uh, problem. So the question is, are there ways to, um, you know, uh, actually directly address action bias. And in economics, there is a, a long tradition of uh, selection bias, uh, selection models to address this issue. So I'm gonna um, start with uh, this canonical model that uh, proposed by Heckman in, back in the 70s. So suppose we have the outcome model that's linear, okay? And we have a selection model where T is equal to either one or zero. We assume some latent uh, variable ti star, and ti, if the ti star is greater than zero, uh, you're, you receive the treatment. ti star is less than zero, you don't receive the treatment. And suppose um, ti star is, uh, is a linear uh, in x. Okay. So this model is uh, pretty popular uh, because, for example, if the error term eta i is normal zero one, then this is um, essentially the probit model. Okay. So you can think of this uh, as a probit model, as a selection model who gets uh, treatment, and the outcome model is the linear regression we've been studying. So why selection arises, selection bias arises in this context? So what does that mean? Well, what this means is that expected conditional expectation of the error term uh, from the outcome equation epsilon i given ti and xi is no longer zero okay so if this is zero then um, uh, error, uh, the treatment is exogenous so you can estimate using the least squares but now no longer um, epsilon i is uh, con conditionally independent of t and x okay so this would happen for example if the two error terms are con um, correlated no, no independent, even condition on x. So imagine there is some unobserved variable ui, which is part of epsilon i, but also influences the treatment. So it's a part of eta i. So we don't observe, so it's in the error term. Right? So same factor ui is in epsilon i as well as eta i. Then even condition on xi, those two error terms are going to be correlated. And that's going to cause this exogeneity assumption to fail. So that's basically the intuition. So there's a some unobservables that are in the two error terms, and that um, leads to the correlation of the error term as a result. Uh, as a result, the even condition on x, epsilon i, and t are correlated now because t is a function of eta. Uh, and eta has the same component ui that's in the epsilon i as well. Okay. So now how does it work? So we can take expectation uh, for the treatment group and expectation of y given x and t equal one and um, using this model. So everything, you know, t and x comes out and everything becomes, uh, is up to this conditional expectation of error term given x and t equal one. Now t equal one means that uh, ti star is greater than zero, which means that eta i is greater than uh, minus lambda minus delta t x. So now the epsilon and the eta are, um, if they are related, this is no longer zero. We cannot drop that uh, complicated um, uh, uh, conditioning uh, information about eta. Right? So the epsilon and the eta are correlated, so no longer I cannot drop this out and set it to zero. Similarly, um, expectation y given x t equals zero has, has the same problem. Okay. So now the question, uh, what you can see then is that uh, those ex ex sort of strange conditional expectation term right, of epsilon i given x and some information about eta i 
is is all conditional on x, so it's actually a function of x. So this is when this is why they call this selection bias as a specification error. So if you just regress naively regress y on alpha uh, y on t and x, you're forgetting this term, the expected value of epsilon i given some x and some other function of x, which is um, you know which is the the forgotten term term, the omitted term that you should have included. Okay. What the heck one did is to derive this term as a function of x and under the assumption that the error terms are bivariate normal. Okay. So as I said, um, error terms are going to be correlated, so low is a correlation um, term. And since the selection model is a binary problem model, uh, the variance is equal to 1. Okay, so that's why this is the bivariate normal model, uh, the covariance term. Covariance matrix looks like that. Sigma square is the variance of epsilon i, and rho is the correlation between the epsilon i and the eta i, and uh, variance of the eta is 1. Okay, so under this um, assumption, we can show that um, this. Uh, expected value of eta give epsilon given x and t is actually um, inverse it's equal to something called inverse Mills ratio and can be written as a function of x okay so we can just include this term in the regression and run run the regression So what Heckman showed is that this omitted variable, uh, conditional expectation of epsilon given x and t, is equal to the following formula. So when for the treatment group, when the t equal 1, the first term is 2 minus 1, so that's 1. Um, and so that's going to equal to the second term, which is the product of the correlation times the standard deviation sigma. And then there's this ratio in the numerator you have density of standard normal evaluated at uh, lambda plus delta times x and in the denominator you have CDF of standard normal evaluated at lambda plus delta times x okay so what this um, and in the control group the first term is going to be 2 times 0 minus 1 so it's basically minus of this this whole um, whole expression so what this suggests is the um, uh, two-step estimation, okay? So you can do a two-step estimation. In the first step, you can uh, estimate the problem model, fit the problem model, and get an estimate of lambda and delta. And once you get those estimates, you can plug that into this uh, expression and then use that as additional covariate in addition to t and x. Okay, uh, multiply by 2t minus 1, obviously, this is plus or minus. And then the coefficient of that term, and then run regression. So then you regress basically y on t and x and 2t minus 1 times this uh, ratio, inverse Mills ratio. And the coefficient is going to be lambda times sigma. That's going to be the coefficient. And since we can estimate the sigma squared from the variance of the residual, uh, we can back out the low, which is a correlation term. Notice that when the correlation is zero, that is the two error terms are uncorrelated, then this term is going to be zero. So there is no immediate variable um, you have to worry about. Okay. Now, this is like a magic where you have you had unobserved variable you're concerned about but through some mathematics um, you are uh, magically reduce the problem to this specification error and in, in addition you can compute this omitted variable as a function of x and then control for it okay however what's really important here is all of this calculation depends on uh, linearity and the bivariate normal error assumption. Okay, that's the thing that that that's the assumption that really allowing you to compute this omitted variable 
even though that's supposed to be unobserved, you can compute it as a function of the observed variable because you made this linearity and by by normal assumption. So if those two assumptions are invalid, then this whole procedure is going to lead to the invalid inference. So this is why I wrote this here as identification by parametric assumption. Right? So this is um, this is not identification by design. It wasn't like a research design, like a regression discontinuity design. It was this is identification by assumption about error term distribution and the linearity of the model. So although this um, method was very, very popular in 80s and 90s, um, uh, it hasn't, it, it's no longer used very much uh, because people, researchers now uh, are concerned more about the credibility of causal inference. Um, so I will um, uh, briefly sort of mention the uh, extension of this type of method, uh, which has been developed in the literature. Um, okay. It's called control function method. Okay. So you can generalize the Heckman selection model idea. So remember the Heckman selection model basically computed this additional variable, the inverse Mills ratio, and you can control for that variable. So this is a variable that, when adjusted for, renders an otherwise endogenous treatment variable exogenous. So once I include this inverse Mills ratio term, I can turn endogenous uh, variable, the, the variable that suffer from unobserved confounder, into exogenous treatment variable. So for non-parametric identification, instead of parametric identification that um, the Heckman proposed, we need uh, instrumental variables. Okay, so this uh, Heckman selection method sort of developed into control function method that um, exploits the instrumental variables, uh, the existence of instru instrumental variables. And for example, if you think about the two stage risk squares we discussed earlier, uh, we can actually formulate the two stage risk square in a different way. So usually the two stage risk squares is that first stage you regress the treatment on the instrument and then compute the predicted uh, treatment value and then include that in the outcome regression. So regress Y on the predicted treatment. Okay. Instead, what you can do is regress the treatment variable on the instrument and the covariate and get the residuals. So this is the residual variation in the treatment that's uh, not associated either Z or X. Okay. And then you can regress the outcome on the treatment variable and X and this residual. Okay. It turns out that this um, gives you the same uh, uh, estimate as the standard two-stage risk squares estimate. Okay. So in this case, we can call this eta hat, these residuals, as a control function. So uh, it turns out this idea of control function method, so come up with this uh, control function eta hat um, that will make the treatment, endogenous treatment exogenous, uh, we can um, generalize this further. So there's sort of uh, the literature on this, and, and you can do this more non-parametrically. And so the invent and new considers uh, is something called triangular system, where you have Y as a function of endogenous treatment, T, and then the treatment is a function of the instrument, Z. Okay. And they show that in this type of setting, that uh, control function is a CDF of the treatment uh, given the instrumental variable. And once you control for this function, then the error term is no longer um, dependent on the treatment. So the treatment becomes exogenous. Okay. I'll